What's the only weekly wrap-up of the top compliance and ethics stories? It is This Week in FCPA with Tom Fox, the voice of compliance, and Jay Rosen, Mr. Monitor. Each week, Tom and Jay highlight 10 stories which caught their collective eye, talk about sports and movies, highlight top podcasts, and preview their upcoming events. Join This Week in FCPA each week for a one-stop review of the week's compliance and ethics highlights. This Week in FCPA is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network. On This Week in FCPA, we take a look at the following stories. Goldman Sachs settles with Malaysia for nearly $3 billion. Mike Volkov reports on two big pharma enforcement actions. What are the shared elements in a best practices compliance program? How can you test your hotline? Why is Germany soft on corporate crime? Whistleblower management in the EU? How can you audit AI? What should be the goal of an effective internal controls program? And we also check in with the following podcast, The Compliance Life. It's AMI Week on Compliance of Coronavirus. And Tom looks at 31 days to a more effective compliance program. All this on This Week in FCPA. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, the voice of compliance, back again with Mr. Monitors himself, Jay Rosen. For This Week in FCPA, episode 216 for the week ending, July 31, 2020, into the month, the 1MDB moves towards resolution edition. As the international fight against corruption took two small steps forward this week, in the 1MDB case, self-isolating Tom and Jay braved the surge of COVID cases by staying safe at home. But we're back to look at some of the week's top compliance and ethics stories and articles which caught our collective eye. What says Mr. Monitors? Mr. Monitors says that the voice of compliance is going to be sad because going forward, J. Lo is going to be married to A. Rod and we will have no more 1MDB. That's what I say. Well, you've uh, you've certainly taken it up a level there that I'm not sure I can, uh, you know, really overcome. But... uh, We've got a lot of stories this week. You want to just hop on in? Go for it, man. All right. We start with a couple of stories from our um, lead article or uh, uh, headline, rather, Goldman Sachs. First is that Goldman Sachs settled with the country of Malaysia for $3.9 billion total for its role in the 1MDB scandal. This, of course, is after Goldman had... uh, fought this tooth and nail and said that they weren't liable for anything because they hadn't done anything wrong because their managing director, uh, Tim Leisner, had lied to them about uh, Jay Rosen's friend, Jay Lowe. I would note that they uh, partied together on a yacht several times in an undisclosed location. Nevertheless, uh, a huge settlement for um, the country of Malaysia and uh, something that uh, I think um, will certainly move the ball forward. What the open question I will have, Jay, which we cannot answer in this podcast, is whether uh, Goldman will receive credit from the Department of Justice under their coordinated resolutions policy going forward, uh, because um, $3.9 billion ain't chicken feed, uh, even in Malaysia. Now, this was bookended by uh, the conviction in a Malaysian court of former Prime Minister Najib Razak, Tuesday on seven counts for looting the 1MDB Sovereign Wealth Fund. The convictions included uh, those for money laundering, abuse of power, and criminal be- breach of trust. The Malaysian court found Najib guilty of transferring about $10 million from a 1MDB affiliate into his personal account. He was prime minister from 2009 to 2018. Of course, the Wall Street Journal has extensively reported on this story, and this conviction, although... Uh, Perhaps a little surprisingly, um, uh, that the uh, Malaysian court was able to actually get a conviction. Nevertheless, it certainly is uh, good news for uh, the international fight against bribery and corruption. And I would add that uh, Harry Casson, of course, uh, broke this story in the United States. So kudos to Harry for uh, breaking that. The original story came to us from Ben Otto and Chester Tay, reporting in the Wall Street Journal. So next up, we have a couple um Pharmaceutical stories coming to us from 
Mike Volkov and his crime and compliance uh, blog. First one, NVIDIA Solutions pleads guilty to false statement and agrees to pay $600 million to resolve criminal and civil investigations. The DOJ's aggressive enforcement of the opioid industry is a striking example of the power of federal prosecutors when focused on an industry. Once prioritized for enforcement, DOJ has quickly brought together prosecutors and law enforcement to target corporate actors and companies with the full force of criminal and civil statutes. The DOJ announced the resolution of its criminal and civil investigations against Indivior, pursuant to which Indivior agreed to plead guilty to making false statements and agreed to pay a total of $600 million to resolve liability for the marketing of its drug, Suboxone. In 2019, Indivior's former parent, Reckitt Bankhauser Group, RB Group, agreed to pay $1.4 billion resolution along with a plea agreement with the former CEO, Sean Thaxter. In total, the illegal marketing of Suboxone has resulted in a $2 billion in penalty, the largest resolution by DOJ against an opioid company. Suboxone is a drug product used by recovering opioid addicts to reduce withdrawal syndrome. As part of its criminal guilty plea, Indivior admitted to making false statements to promote the film version of Suboxone to the Massachusetts Medicaid program. Indivior admitted that in October of 2012, it sought to convince MassHealth to expand Medicaid coverage of Suboxone film in Massachusetts and sent MassHealth false data indicating that Suboxone film had the lowest rate of accidental pediatric exposure. And Divior further admitted that this false information was also contained in marketing and promotional efforts directed at MassHealth. DOJ's resolution includes several requirements that are novel in scope and application. First, they require the company to disband its Suboxone sales force and not reinstate it. Two, requires the company's CEO to personally certify under penalty of perjury on an annual basis that Indivior was in compliance with the FDA. Three, prohibit Indivior from using data obtained from surveys to healthcare providers for marketing. And four, require Indivior to, rather, in, yeah, Indivior to remove healthcare providers from its promotional programs. Finally, there's a corporate integrity agreement. Indivior executed a five-year CIA with HHS OIG, which requires Indivior to implement numerous accountability and auditing provisions. Annually, top executives in the board have to certify compliance. In addition, Indivior has to conduct annual risk assessments and other monitoring by an independent review organization known as an IRL. On the other side now, the DOJ has an anti DOJ's antitrust division uh, has a multi-year criminal cartel investigation of the generic pharmaceutical industry that's gaining steam. The latest company to settle is Taro Pharmaceuticals, which agreed to enter a deferred prosecution agreement and pay $205 million penalty to resolve charges. DOJ's investigation picked up significant momentum when it settled charges against Sandoz, a large generic manufacturer, which agreed to pay $195 million and cooperate in the investigation. Two other companies, Rising Pharmaceuticals and Heritage Pharmaceuticals, entered into deferred prosecution agreements last year. Taro agreed that it had earned more than $500 million in sales related to its illegal conduct and agreed to cooperate in the ongoing probe. Taro's cartel activity related to generic pharmaceuticals used to treat seizures, bipolar disorder, and arthritis. Two former company execs, Ara Abrahamian, was um, indicted in February 2020 for his role in the price-fixing conspiracy. Taro also admitted participating in a second conspiracy with another generic company based in Pennsylvania between May 2013 and December 2015. State attorney generals, along with private parties, have ongoing civil cases challenging numerous companies in the generic pharmaceutical industry for legal price fixing and cartel activities. So um, is it me, Tom, or do we always keep coming back to these large global pharma companies and they either like to send people on trips to Disneyland or engage in uh, 
cartel-like behavior. So uh, we don't seem to be learning much in that front. What's up next, Tom? Well, I'm not going to Disneyland. Um, <laughs> but what I am going to talk about is an article by Jacqueline Jager over at Compliance Week where she looked at a recent Navex Global uh, definitive risk and compliance benchmark report to determine some of the shared elements of best-in-class risk and compliance programs. And some of the key elements found in uh, the NAVEX report included leadership buy-in and oversight, escalation policy requiring direct reporting to the board, a risk-based training program for board members, third parties, and employees, a hotline and incident management system, processes to prevent retaliation, routine audits to inform decision-making, and the implementation of a purpose-built solution to automate processes and administer program elements. Uh, one, uh, If there was one key finding, though, it was a culture of trust, that organizations with a strong, positive culture of trust have more developed programs and demonstrate better compliance program performance. So um, interesting findings, and uh, as always, great article by Jacqueline. Uh, so next up, we've got something from... Radical compliance, and that means it's coming to us from the coolest guy in compliance, Matt Kelly. Uh, Matt was recently in a ethics and compliance chat room, and somebody had a question about how should a compliance officer test his or her external hotline provider. Uh, This sent Matt thinking upon some uh, potential solutions, and he reached out to some of his colleagues. First, Matt was surprised to see how difficult it is to set up a compliance hotline. The painstaking challenge simply of getting local phone numbers established in varying parts of the world, which would then forward local phone calls to a handful of call centers across across the globe. That issue lingered unresolved for weeks and involved complaints to the vendor, escalation, conference calls, and ultimately the company either dumped or never signed on with the vendor. Here's the first thing you want to do is test the logs and the workflows. Once compliance professionals with a background in software testing said that before you even get to testing the hotline with actual calls, you should test the configuration of your system to be sure incidents called into the hotline follow your desired workflows. For example, a call about accounting fraud in a high-priority matter should go directly to the CFO, general counsel, compliance officer, and maybe even the audit committee chair. So create temporary email addresses for those roles and see whether or not an incident logged as accounting fraud reaches its intended destination. Ideally, you should run this test for every type of incident you want to track. Accounting fraud, FCPA trouble, sexual harassment, fair label standards, and so forth. Next, test the hotline calls themselves. Another line of discussion was about how employees will use the hotline on a daily basis. This is especially important for global businesses because you're going to have employees calling in countries from around the world, and this means you'll need a reporting hotline that can overcome the language barrier. Mr. FCP Translation, my former uh, self, would be very happy hearing that. For starters, have volunteers around the world test the hotline by calling their local number to submit predetermined complaints. What you should be looking for is does the phone number work? Can the call center rep speak fluently in whatever language the employee is using? Is the allegation recorded correctly? And does the call center rep follow any other tagging procedures? One point raised in the chat boards was the importance of -of out-of-country language tests for regions such as Europe, Africa, or Southeast Asia, where multiple small countries are in close proximity and might speak each other's language. Yet another tip, test your vendor with calls that mention the primary hotline contacts themselves and see whether the complaint is routed to someone else at your company. And for what it's worth, one of the first radical compliance Matt ever wrote back in the dark ages in February 2016 was an exploration of whistleblower hotline statistics you might want to track about retaliation. This could make a good companion reading after you've got your hotline tested, implemented, and hopefully running strong. The Wirecard case, which I'm exploring in depth with your colleague, Mikhail Ryder-Gordon, on a special podcast series on the FCPA compliance report, has raised an interesting issue about corporate enforcement by German regulators. 
And picking up on that theme, Dick Casson over at the FCPA blog said uh, in Germany, uh, regulators are soft on, on crime, not tough. And as he called it, a weird tolerance for corporate crime. So he looked at the record, uh, obviously starting uh, as far back as Siemens, but uh, Volkswagen was uncovered by the state of California, Wirecard by others. Uh, Deutsche Bank has not been fined nearly as much in Germany as it has in America. And uh, there have been multiple cases against uh, FCPA cases against German companies, SAP, Allianz, Lind Group, Zimmer Biomet, Billfinger, Deutsche Telekom, and Daimler Chrysler, or I suppose it's simply Daimler now. Nevertheless, um, so what's the problem with uh, German enforcement? Uh, Transparency International says that Wirecard is not an isolated case. It's a structural problem problem with the German legal system. It's not simply the regulators are to blame, although you have to lay a large part of the Wirecard imbroglio on German regulators, who when presented evidence by uh, the Financial Times in its articles on Wirecard's malfeasance, actually brought criminal proceedings against the reporters, um, But uh, Germany has been extraordinarily spotty, and they don't have the laws, and they don't have the will, and they haven't backed it up at all. So uh, France has step on two. Obviously, the U.K. Bribery Act came into into law as a result of the abysmal uh, U.K. prosecution against uh, bribery and corruption from the first decade of this year. And uh, France uh, came into step on two. Spain has a law. Uh, So uh, Dick wonders if um, the Wirecard scandal, which rivaled rivals Enron's rise and fall for gruesome corporate and regulatory misbehavior, will be the catalyst for change that Germany needs. So uh, kudos to Dick for a very thought-provoking article. Great. Next up, Tom, is the first of two coming to us from our colleague uh, Sarah Haddon's uh, Corporate Compliance Insights. And in honor of National Whistleblower Appreciation Day, Frank Stellens discusses the EU Whistleblower Protection Directive, WPD, at length. Frank explains the regulation's broad impact and offers guidance for compliance. Most listed companies and large public organizations already consider whistleblowing management as an important governance mechanism with, and in most cases, boards, audit committee being accountable to measure their effectiveness. However, many other organizations still have a different position on the subject. Some of the reasons offered for not facilitating whistleblower management include self-denial or self-protection by company management, a non-transparent culture or fear of abusive reporting. It is not a regulatory mandate in most countries, lack of budget or other investment priorities, and lack of knowledge. Key arguments for facilitating whistleblowing management are Having a speak-up culture which helps reduce employee turnover. Whistleblowers have been have been proven to be the most effective information source on protection against unethical and criminal behavior. Whistleblowing helps to avoid public disclosures and associated reputational risk. And whistleblowing management will become mandatory in Europe as a result of the new EU Whistleblowing Protection Directive. The scope of the EU PD. Within the EU, all members shall have until December 17th of 2021 to transpose the new whistleblower protection rules into national law. The scope of breaches, protection of persons reporting on breaches of EU law, and member states are encouraged to extend the scope to national law breaches. And the scope of protection, all internal and external persons relating to the reporting of wrongdoing in a work-related context. In terms of managing key risks, here are the things Frank recommends looking at. Stage whistleblowing threats. If an employee learns about eminent sanctions dismissal or missing out on promotion salary increases in the future, it could trigger him or her to seek protection as a whistleblower. Public disclosure immunity. Not providing feedback within the deadline and not facilitating Tier 1 internal reporting or improper communication on three-tier reporting structure could lead to public disclosure, immunity for that whistleblower, abusive reporting coverage, the principle of free choice between Tier 1 and Tier 2 reporting, and the reverse burden of proof around these treatments will lead to more abusive reporting. 
So what should an organization already have planned for the end of the year? Whistleblowing management gap analysis to better understand readiness status, a platform selection process to ensure the right choice of technology, service provider selection to ensure prompt access of all required support, process design drafting, including whistleblowing policies, identity, identity protection setup, and partial case management organization, triage protocols, and feedback monitoring. Information approach drafting to comply with information duties toward employers, ISO 37002 certification preparation, and association support solicitation with the objective to develop standardized approaches on sector level for small organizations. So, Tom, now I'll turn it it over to you for a discussion of AI. Yes, uh, James Bone, who contributes over at uh, Corporate Compliance Insights, wrote a really interesting piece, uh, Jay, entitled Auditing Artificial Intelligence, subtitled Planning an AI Audit Engagement. And uh, although neither you and I are auditors, I thought it it, it should be read by every compliance practitioner Uh, because he lists out the six elements of an AI ecosystem, which should be audited against. And I thought that was certainly worthwhile. Number one, artificial intelligence, ethics, and governance models. What are your governance rules? Two, formal standards and procedures for the implementation of AI engagements, i.e. policies and procedures. Three, data, model management, governance, and and privacy, other uh, issues. Four, understanding human-machine integration, interactions, decision, support, and outcome. Here we might think about the twins and their interaction with their parents, um, who wins and who doesn't. Uh, five, third-party AI vendor management. Even in AI uh, the AI world, third parties present a huge risk. And finally, six, cybersecurity vulnerability, risk management, and business continuity. Certainly appropriate at any time, but in the era of COVID-19, even greater. So uh, you start by uh, auditing against these standards. You may have to benchmark your own. You may have to benchmark industry standards. You may have to benchmark uh, other standards outside of your industry. But it's interesting that he explores what this means for internal auditors. And I think uh, this may be something that I would have said the compliance professional of the future, but the future apparently is now. So uh, compliance officers may need to uh, to be up on. Great, Tom. And uh, for our last story of the day, uh, we're going back to the risk compliance platform Europe, and it's a, a repeat a visit with our colleague Alex Movchen, and he interviews Edmund Sanders, and the topic is effective internal control systems decreases to an acceptable level of risk not meeting the objectives. Recently, Alex had an opportunity to speak with Edmund Saunders, who is president of the Institute for Internal Controls Europe and an ex-advisor from the UK government to Polish officials. He's also experienced and dedicated in the following fields of internal controls, fraud, internal auditing, risk management, and international banking. Um, Edmund's opinion, option to build an effective internal control system in any organization, he believes it's essential to fully understand the three main CASO publications, especially CASO 2013, and to fully differentiate internal controls from internal audit. What advice would he give to management of both public and private financial institutions in Eastern Europe to bring their organizations to the level of best practices on a global basis? Edmund believes that to build effective governance and risk management, an essential first step is to define what is meant today by internal controls following COSO 213 principles. An effective system of internal controls reduces to an acceptable level the risk of not achieving the objectives of an organization. The sentence is important because it emphasizes the fact that the purpose of controls is to address risk and that you have to have, quote, enough, unquote, control when the risk is at the desired levels. To this, it means, number one, before you assess the effectiveness of internal control, you need to know the objective because we're talking about the risk to objectives, not the risk out of context. Two, you need to know the risk to those objectives. 
three, you need to know what is an acceptable level of risk for each objective. And finally, you need to be able to assess whether the controls provide reasonable assurance that the risk is acceptable level. Final question that Alex asked is, what would be your advice to young professionals in an internal controls and auditing on building a career? Edmund recommends to concentrate on getting professional banking qualifications as quickly as possible, becoming um, second in the, if you've chosen the job functions to give you the most experience in banking that you can choose. And finally, a lot of hard work. So uh, it's uh, really interesting, the different professionals that Alex is bringing to his interviews, and we'd look to have more of them coming down the pipe. Tom, uh, there's a lot of AMI on the CPN, the Compliance Podcast Network, this week. Uh, so I don't blow our own whistle. Could you tell us about some of my colleagues and what you discussed? Sure. Uh, it was AMI Week on Compliance and Coronavirus, where Jerry Coyne discussed telemedicine and COVID-19. Don Stern took a look at uh, how prosecutors are uh, coping with COVID-19, what this means for white-collar prosecutors, and really, Jay, the importance of self-disclosure to the Department of Justice going forward. We closed out with Mikhail uh, Ryder-Gordon on compliance issues around business reopenings. Uh, As I mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, Mikhail and myself are doing a deep dive into Wirecard. That's on the FCPA compliance report that posted today. We had uh, your colleague, uh, Vin DeCiani, as a part of 31 Days to a More Effective Compliance Program this week, where he talked about data and uh, and data as a third-party risk management strategy. Uh, it was a really interesting uh, spin that Ben put on it. Additionally, we talked about freight forwarders, risk ranking in the supply chain, some uh, enforcement actions, and uh, where we're going to go in August uh, as well, which will be the role of the board of directors. On uh, the Compliance Life, I concluded my four-part series with Scott Sullivan, where on uh, posting Tuesday, posting Tuesday, we took a look at um, Scott's thoughts on the CCO and compliance function roll down the road uh, when we get to 2021 and beyond. Do we have a sneak peek on who our guest is going to be for the month of August? Lewis Sapperman, uh CCO at Panasonic US, so or Panasonic North America. So uh, just uh, wrapping up, producing Lewis's four podcasts. He's a uh, he's a good friend. He has been through the FCPA wars. He has a really interesting professional background um, and a personal background, which he shares with us. And uh, Lewis is well known to the compliance community regularly speaks at compliance conferences. So I was thrilled to be able to sit down literally for an hour or so with him and learn more about him and his thoughts on the role of the CCI getting to the CCO, getting to the CCO chair, and where uh, CCOs may be going as well. Lewis is uh, a great person, very generous. So I'm definitely looking forward to uh, learning more about the sto- the backstory of uh, his uh, participation in the ethics and compliance world. So, Jay, if I can mention uh, one upcoming webinar from K2 Finn, uh, they're going to take a look at a really narrow area, area, but I think, once again, compliance practitioners need to be aware of it. It's new sanctions development in the maritime se- sector, uh, UK sanctions, uh, shipping guidance, and Venezuelan shipping. And for everyone in the compliance world, Venezuela is becoming as toxic as Cuba and North Korea. So, uh, good stuff from uh, K2 Finn. Uh, we've got registration and information in the show notes, and now you can uh, register. So uh, uh, if you're interested at all in Venezuelan sh- sanctions, uh, maritime sanctions, and shipping guidance, this is a uh, webinar for you. Great. Thanks for telling us about that, Tom. Um, so I guess all I've got to wrap up here from Simi Valley is um, we're a couple of weeks out from starting school, so we're in the dog days of summer here. Uh, Last night, we actually went to an outdoor concert at a local mall. It was pretty interesting. They parked cars with one car spot in between. So you could picnic there and you could wear a mask like we all did. But it was uh, nice to get out and hear some Motown tunes and uh, do something fun with the family. So, uh, Tom, did you uh, 
do anything crazy and wild like that, or you're just home at the do- home with the dogs and Mrs. Compliance. Mrs. Compliance Evangelist and I are uber self isolating. Okay. Well, I, I hope you'll still speak to me next week with my uh, somewhat going off off the rails here. But uh, on behalf of Tom Fox, the Compliance Evangelist and the Voice of Compliance. And myself, Jay Rosen, a.k.a. Mr. Monitor, would like to thank you for joining us for this week in FCPA, episode 216, for the week ending July 31st, 2020. The 1MDB moves towards resolution edition, or as Tom has to say, bye-bye, J-Lo. We hope you will all be safe and healthy. We hope you have a great weekend. Thank you for spending some time with us. And we will talk to you in August. Thanks. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of This Week in FCPA. If you have any questions, you can email Jay at jrosen at affiliatedmonitors.com. You can email me, Tom Fox, at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. We also got a new really cool app on the Compliance Podcast Network website where you can leave a voicemail or a message. If you like to ask us a question or have a topic you would like us to consider. I hope you'll join us again next week when Jay and I look at some of the top compliance and ethics stories for the week that is to become. This Week in FCPA is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network and a proud member of C-Suite Radio. Thanks again for listening, and we look forward to visiting with you again.